Bishop, thank you for taking out the time. I'm trying to remember how many times we've actually had sit downs. <laughs> Maybe five, six. It's, it's been a few times over the years, but it's always good to be with you, Mike. So I thought it would be a neat idea to come to the cathedral. Our first one was here. So we'll uh, wrap it up here. Uh, it's retirement time for you. Have you thought about that a lot? Yeah, I have, and it's getting close. Um, again, I think you know how the process works on April 1st, which is my 75th birthday. By the law of the church, I have to submit my letter of resignation from office to the Holy Father. And it's up to the Holy Father, to the Pope, to accept that whenever uh, he is so inclined. I don't know exactly the timeline for that. That's the mysterious part for me. It could be accepted on the day that I turn 75 on April 1st. That's happened sometimes in the past. It could be delayed by a few weeks, a few months, or a year. That part's out of my hand. But the uh, process for retirement is certainly underway. Have you written the letter yet? Not yet. At least not on paper. Oh, really? <laughs> I, have it, I have it in my mind, but it's, uh, it's not uh, committed to paper yet. But it will be coming soon. It will be on its way to Rome by April 1st. What do you put in that letter? I don't know. I've never written one of these letters before. I think basically it's relatively brief um, in fulfillment of the law of the church, Canon 401. Uh, having turned 75 years of age, I now submit uh, my resignation from office to the Holy Father. And um, it's then in his hands to accept it whenever he wants. It could come right away or it could be delayed for some time. There are some bishops who um, are 77 years old and are still serving, but they don't have coadjutors. As you know, now we have a coadjutor, my successor, who's already been named for this diocese. So I think that will probably uh, speed up the process a little bit. That was your idea, right? Yes, it was. Why? Well, we had the unusual situation of having uh, Bishop Evans who's a classmate of mine, uh, having just turned 75, he retired, and knowing that I would be retiring, presumably within the same six month period, I thought that would leave a pretty serious vacuum in the diocese, a rather dramatic change of leadership in a short time. So I thought it would be good for the diocese to have my successor already in place, so that when I do retire, the um, leadership of the diocese would continue without too much disruption. Well, Bishop Montano is still working, one of the guys you mentioned. I think he's 77 or something. Yeah, like. so it doesn't always happen right away, but it depends, I think, on the circumstances of the diocese and if they already have a successor named and what's going on in the life of the bishop, are there health concerns? There are a whole bunch of factors that might uh, determine when the retirement actually begins. Is the transition starting? Uh, bishop Penning is already here. He's everywhere. He's going to parishes and schools, uh, different personality than you. He seems quiet, <laughs> uh, not that you're loud, uh, but uh, is this transition already starting? Yes. As you say, Bishop Heading has been here since the end of uh, January, and he has really hit the ground running. He's doing a terrific job getting around the diocese, as you say, into parishes and schools and organizations. He's meeting with priests. He's uh, making himself very present to our parishes and schools. So he's learning very, very quickly. And I'm um, so grateful, so blessed that he will be our successor here and will take over the leadership of the diocese. He's terrific. He's going to be a wonderful bishop for this diocese. So I'm very, very pleased and very comforted by that as well. So I was there the <coughs> day they introduced you, 18 years ago. Uh, so 18 years go by. When you came into the diocese, did you accomplish a lot of what you wanted? Was it hard to look through the future at that point? Well, I don't know. When, when I came in the diocese, I don't know if I had a clear set of goals that I was intending to do A, B, C, and D. Um, you come into the diocese and you want to continue the work of Christ. You want to continue the work of the church in whatever way the new diocese would present that to you. So um, that's been my goal, really, is to stay united to Christ, to continue his work, to proclaim his gospel and to continue the work of the church in this uh, local church and in this diocese. And that changes, of course, from, from day to day and from, from year to year in its details. The essence is always the same. We're here to preach the gospel, to bring about salvation of souls, to help people, to lead them ultimately to eternal life. But that's, um, uh, it changes from, from day to day and place to place in, into exactly what that means. You respond to the challenges as they come along. All right, before we talk about the challenges, let's talk about uh, the different things you're proud of. I have to imagine the, 50, actually probably $52 million, your capital campaign that you raised. That was something you really wanted to do on the anniversary of the uh, diocese. Uh, you have to be happy with that. 
Yes, that was a great success, again, due to the leadership of our pastors and so many other leaders in the diocese, but the real uh, outpouring of generosity from our people. Our people have been really generous in all the times we've asked them for support, including um, the capital campaign and our annual Catholic Charity Appeal, which is going on now, of course. Our people have been wonderfully generous, and I'm so, so grateful for that. So that was a good success and an important uh, initiative for the diocese. Was it tough raising the money in a down economy, COVID also, they were still raising money during COVID, I believe. Yeah, we were just at the end of our campaign when COVID hit three years ago. Um, so we were fortunate in that way that most of our campaign was done. And I have to say that according to the reports we're getting, people have been very faithful in fulfilling their pledges. So we're going to do very well in collecting the, the money that was pledged, but there are always challenges. It can be a, a, a pandemic, it can be a downturn in economy, it can be bad headlines for the church, it could be any number of things, the decline of people going to mass on Sundays. There are always challenges. So if you wait for a perfect time to do a campaign like that, you would never do a campaign. Where's that money going? You it's going to all the um, discrete um, purposes we outlined in the campaign for Catholic education, Catholic charities, priest retirement, seminary education, parishes, a good portion of the money went back directly to the parishes as well. So that was very helpful and we're, we're grateful for that. Seems like you've kind of taken on, and you uh, tweeted something about it uh, a couple of weeks ago, helping out the homeless, those who are less fortunate. Emmanuel House, for example, is a shelter that's open to the public and I'm sure it's been pretty busy. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I am grateful for and I, I guess proud of during my 18 years is we really have increased the the charitable outreach the social ministry works of our church with places like emmanuel house the emergency shelter for the homeless which has been open now for 11 or 12 years so that predates a lot of this homeless crisis that we've heard about recently emmanuel house has been there for more than 10 years our work with keep the keep the heat on campaign it's raised over four million dollars now to provide heating assistance for people. Our Gabriel's Call, the program that provides assistance for pregnant moms and new moms and newborn children, provides material and, and social assistance for them. Uh, St. Martin de Porres Center, the center here in Providence for uh, elderly people, especially in, in the uh, urban core. We've done so much in terms of doing the charitable work of the church, increasing our social outreach. I'm very grateful for that and very proud of the impact our church has had in this state, in this community, over the years. Keep in mind, we are the second largest provider of charitable assistance in the state after the state itself. So we've done well with that, and there are always more needs, of course, and we will continue to do our best, but we've done well in trying to reach out to various uh, needs and, and priorities in the state. Bishop, many dioceses <laughs> have uh, declared bankruptcy, especially with the sex abuse scandal. Diocese of Providence <laughs> has not. That's going to be somewhat of an accomplishment too. It is, and it depends, I think, a lot on the local um, conditions, the local legislation. The last number I saw is something like 30 dioceses across the country have entered into bankruptcy because of the lawsuits that come about primarily because of sexual abuse. We've been very fortunate that um, we haven't had to do that. Right now, as I am about to uh, leave the administration, the diocese, we are in pretty stable, pretty healthy financial uh, condition. We're paying our bills, we have some reserves, um, we're meeting all of our needs, we're continuing and expanding our ministries. Financially, the church here is in pretty good shape at the moment, but conditions change and we don't know what the future holds, but right now, uh, we're doing okay. You talked about this church being the second biggest social service agency in the state of Rhode Island behind the state. COVID hits, you're not considered an essential worker. That bother you? Well, again, that was a technical definition that was based on, um, you know, the needs of the state and the pandemic and the restrictions and the, the state of emergency and so forth. Um, I wasn't too bothered by that because I know that when all is said and done, the work of the church and the work that our priests and religious and lay ministers do, it is essential. It's essential for the sake of our salvation in the end. In a given moment, if the state says we're not essential workers, I know what they mean. We, we're not first responders in that sense. We're not law enforcement. We're not medical personnel. I know what that means. It but doesn't bother me open. too much. Stores were open though. 
stores are open and our churches for the most part um we we certainly cut back on uh, religious services, masses and weddings and funerals and so forth. We never shut down completely. Our churches were open for visits and for the most part we were able to do masses with smaller groups of people in spacing and masks and temperature checks and all that. So in many ways the basic work of the church continued even if it was restricted in some ways. We never shut down completely. Obviously there was some irony where you could go into a store and buy produce and on that Palm Sunday of the, of the pandemic year, we weren't allowed to hand out palm branches. That was very frustrating for me, very irritating. We weren't even asking to have mass for Palm Sunday. We just wanted to put palm branches outside the church. And the state said, we really shouldn't do that. And some local officials said, please don't do that. But at the same time, people were going into stores and buying bananas and apples and pears and plums, and, but they couldn't come to the church to get palm branches. So there were some ironies during that time. Um, you know, we, I remember the time when they were shutting down the beaches and the parks and so forth, saying, don't go outside. A few months later, they were saying, take it outside. Go outside, get some fresh air and exercise. It's good for you. Um, well, it was something they'd never experienced before. That's exactly, really and I think that's why everybody needs a little bit of... Uh, uh, patience and, and forgiveness and understanding. It's easy to go back now and say, why do we do that? Who decided that? Was that important? But we were in the midst of a pandemic we hadn't had in 100 years, and nobody knew how lethal, how deadly this would be. So I think we need to give a lot of leverage and, and a lot of patience and understanding to civil officials and church officials who, who made difficult decisions. Closing down our churches in March of, of, of the pandemic, what, three years ago, that was a very difficult decision for me. It was painful, but we did what we did for the common good as we knew it at that time. And thank God, on the positive note, um, uh, we've done pretty well in, in recovering from all that. People are coming back to masses, our schools are doing well, the enrollment is stable or increased in some places. So we've bounced back quickly, and we're, we're very grateful for that. All right, we'll talk about the schools in a second. Yeah, they actually have thrived. Uh, some of the schools who were even struggling to stay open saw a major increase in, in enrollment. Yes. But what about the churches? There are some that really have been affected by COVID. Yeah, they have. And um, as you know, even before COVID, there was a declining uh, attendance at mass, declining sacramental participation, even before COVID. Um, and COVID didn't help that at all. So people stayed away. Some people got used to watching Mass online, it was live streamed from their local parish church. Most churches did that, I think. So it was difficult for people, but I'm hearing now, and again, we haven't done a formal census or count of Mass attendance for a number of years, but I'm hearing anecdotally that people are coming back to Mass now uh, in this season of Lent, which is just concluding. I've heard of some great responses to Lenten missions that our churches have had. Churches have had great attendance at Holy Lenten, Apostles did Lenten 600 services. People. Yeah, it's, it's been pretty amazing. So people are coming back. Some we've lost, I suppose. Um, some are still perhaps afraid to come out into a crowd. Some have gotten comfortable staying home and watching it uh, on, on, live, on live stream. Or some lost interest too, when you think some about it. Some lost interest, I'm sure, and they realize they were comfortable staying home on Sunday mornings. That's unfortunate because we need, we need God in our lives. We need the sacraments. We need to be with a faith community. People who have turned away from that, um, that's a terrible loss for them. What about schools? They, the enrollments went up. There are no schools closing in the diocese, <coughs> correct? Not that I'm aware of at this time. As we see we Bishop have, Conley closing in Fall River. Right, yeah, I'm not aware of any schools that are close to closing at this time. Right. Again, that changes from year to year, but right now, I think our schools are pretty steady, pretty stable, and I'm not aware of any that are close to closing in the diocese. Um, Why do you think that is? Well, um, I think during the pandemic, our Catholic schools stayed open more than the public schools did. So I think parents who are anxious to have their kids in classrooms turn to Catholic schools. Um, I think some of the issues going on in some of the um, public schools, I think, have turned some parents off perhaps, and they want to come to the more stable atmosphere of the Catholic schools and more traditional values and spiritual and moral values. I think some parents have come to that. So our schools, for the most part, not, not universally, but for the most part, the enrollment has been stable, or as you say, has increased in some, some situations. And that's a, that's a positive thing as well. 
All right, so the Frank Sinatra song, My Way, it says <laughs> one of the lyrics, regrets, I have a few. We all have regrets in life. Uh, some of your channel, let's stay with schools for a second. Um, in 18 years, he opened up Immaculate uh, Conception in Cranston, but a number of clothes that had to, that had to bother you. Yeah, it's always sad to close a school, close a church, because these things are important for people. Um, whether it's a school where their children have formed friendships and communities and so forth, that's hard for the kids and for the parents and for the teachers who often are very deeply invested in the school itself. It's always hard to close a school. We're very blessed, very fortunate in the last few years we haven't had to close any schools in the diocese. That's, that's terrific, that's wonderful. It's not true everywhere. You mentioned uh, Fall River. Um, the Archdiocese of New York just announced the closing of 12 schools at the end of this year. It's a big change for them. So we're very blessed that we have people who are supporting our schools, parents sending the kids, our teachers are involved. We have terrific administrators and pastors. So the schools are doing okay, but closing of a school is a very, a very difficult thing, but sometimes it just becomes inevitable. If you don't have the enrollment, if you don't have the finances, you can't provide a good education any longer, and that's, that's not fair. So sometimes it has to happen but we're fortunate it hasn't happened for a few years now in the diocese. Six years ago, you told me we probably have more churches and parishes that we need. That still hold true? Yeah, I think it is. When I came to the diocese 18 years ago, uh, we had 150 parishes. As we sit here today, we have 120. So in these last 18 years, we've closed 30 uh, churches. In other situations, we've had uh, churches merge into one parish, but two or three churches are still open. We're very grateful. Our priests have been tremendously generous. Um, many of our priests now have more than one job. They're covering two parishes, or a parish and another ministry, hospital ministry, or a parish and a chancery uh, ministry. Our priests have been wonderful in being generous in sharing their, their energy, their time, their talent in more than one um, uh, assignment. And that's going to continue going on to the future. Most of the dioceses in this part of the world, at least in the north and east and the Midwest, are downsizing, closing churches. It's happening in, um, certainly I said New York, it's happening in St. Louis, in Cincinnati, in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, lots of dioceses around this part of the country are merging, downsizing, closing churches because the population is shrinking. So what do you do? It's not the same as it, as it used to be. You had mentioned that, you know, one guy can't run two or three for a long time down the road. Now we're seeing that one guy is running two parishes. When does that come to an end? Well, I don't know. It, it might be a new, uh, a new normal that a priest just has more than one assignment. Now, having said that, he has to budget his time. He has to learn um, the skills of time management. You can't be everywhere. You're afraid of burnout? All the time. Burnout's certainly an issue for a priest, um, but again, they have to learn time management. And people also, our parishioners also have to be very patient, understanding. They might not have the same mass schedule now that they had 10 years ago. Instead of having four masses on a weekend, maybe they'll only have two. Um, instead of having three masses on a weekend, maybe they only have one. But there will be mass in the sacraments available, widely available, as you know so well. Rhode Island is a very small state. In terms of geography, it's a very small diocese. So people are never more than a few miles away from a church that is open and operating and offering mass and sacraments. So that downsizing of churches, the changing in mass schedules, that's going to continue. We don't need as many masses now as we had 20 years ago or 50 years ago. That will continue, but people have to be understanding that our priests can only do so much. They can't be in every nursing home every week. They can't be in every church every Sunday. They can't be at a 10 o'clock mass every day. Um, people have to be patient, understanding our priests are working very hard, doing their very best. No closings of churches this year that you know of? Um, there, right now, there's no active processes to close any churches. Again, the, uh, we're just getting into our personnel season. There will be some new assignments for priests. Few are retiring. Some other priests will be moved and changed. That's not final yet, so I don't have all the details. But that happens every year uh, during personnel season. So there will be more changes, but right now I don't think there are any churches on the cusp of, of closing. Canon Law is retirement 75. 
Ken, Ken Law says at the age of, it's sort of like it is for bishops, at the age of 75, a priest is asked to submit his retirement to the bishop. But in Rhode Island, they can do it at 70. In this diocese, and I think most dioceses now, a priest can ask to retire at the age of 70. And we've done that, and I've respected that. And uh, it's, it's important to know, too, that when our priests retire, many of them, depending on their health, uh, continue to be very, very active and fill in for priests other places that go for masses and funerals and weddings. Um, even our senior priests who are retired from administration um, have been very active and very generous in, in helping out. And we couldn't function without the help of our senior priests. Seminary has five guys <coughs> from province. That's not a lot. Well, altogether right now we have 15 seminarians. That's in college and the theology. Right. 15 altogether, which is about an average of what we've had in a few years. Um, we have one being ordained this year in Rome. Um, so we'll have 14 seminarians. However, I'm told we're also in the process of receiving four new seminarians for the fall semester. If that all happens, if that comes true, we'll have 18 seminarians. You're correct though, it's not enough. We should have twice that number to take care of the needs of the diocese. But we've worked hard to promote vocations and we hope and pray that God will help us with that going forward. Dominicans see a <coughs> surge in vocations, why? Well, I think the Dominicans have done really well with vocations because they're very uh, clear in their identity. They're involved in campus ministry. A lot of young guys like that. They have a strong academic background. The Eastern province of the Dominicans, and you know there's more than one group around the country, but the Eastern province of the Dominicans, St. Joseph province, have done very, very well. We benefit from that here too, of course, at Providence College. They're, they're terrific. There's a lot of young guys and they're well, well trained and, and very energetic and very faithful. You mentioned <clears> to me <throat> five years ago, one of the things that bothered you or what disappointed you was the fact that guys you ordained that dropped out of the priesthood still weighs on you? Yeah, it's always disappointing um, because when a man's ordained to the priesthood, he makes a lifetime commitment to Christ and to his church. We know that's not always fulfilled. It happens in marriage as well. But it's, it's also very disturbing when a priest who is ordained um, for a lifetime commitment to Jesus and to the church and to the diocese, for whatever reason, um, takes a different path and goes in a different direction. He drops out of the priesthood. I think in the 18 years I've been here, there have been about 10 priests who have left the ministry permanently. That's tragic, it's very sad. Most of them were really, really good men um, who were doing good work. And it's hard on the, their brother priests, it's hard on the people they were serving, and it's, I think, difficult for the individual. There's different reasons. Sometimes there's uh, some bad behavior, or relationships they get involved in, or a lack of faith, their faith dies, um, some addictions, some abuses. Um, it's always sad when it happens, though, and it's a source of great pain for me for the rest of the priest and for the parishioners as well. And people will always ask, has the church done enough with the sexual abuse scandal? Probably haven't done enough. I'm not sure that will ever be true. The sexual abuse crisis, the scandal is a terrible, terrible chapter in the, in the history of the church. Um, and we've all suffered from it. We always think first of all, of the individuals, the kids, the families who have suffered, the, the survivors, the victims of sexual abuse, it's terrible. And we know that when they are abused that way, that their life can be changed forever, their faith can be demolished. It's a terrible event. It's left a real burden on the life of the church that we continue to work with and, and pay for, not just financially, but I think in terms of the faith life of our people as well. Have we done enough? We've done a lot, but um, I don't think we could ever reach a point where we've I said we've done enough and it's over. It's not over and we continue to work with that. But it's, as you know, it's a plague in society and culture. Church has, has paid its price, continues to pay its price. We've also taken some strong initiatives to turn the, the, the page around to, to begin dealing with it differently. And I think we've made some, some progress. I think in the last 30 years of this diocese, I think we've only had two active cases of sexual abuse reported in 30 years. Almost all the cases we're dealing with go back 30, 40, 50, 
60 years. That doesn't make them any better, but it does say that this is a, a problem that dwells mostly in history and we're doing much, much better now in dealing with the crisis. And, um, but we're not done yet. We have to be very vigilant. We have to be very firm and, and, not, deal, and not accepting that kind of bad behavior. Pope Francis celebrates his 10th anniversary. <laughs> you told me once you thought he was intriguing. <laughs> is he still intriguing? He's still very intriguing. You know, every pope is different. Certainly Pope Francis is different than, than Pope Benedict, who just passed away, of course, of happy memory, of blessed memory, and St. John Paul II and the popes before them. Every pope is different. He brings into his office his own personality, his own experiences, his own ministry. So Pope Francis is still intriguing, but I think he's, he's been the, the right pope for our time. I, I, when I think of Pope Francis, I like to describe him as a prophet. You know, he has challenged the conscience of the church and the world on some of these issues that are very important to him. Immigration, the care of the poor, uh, reaching out to those who are on the margins of society. He's sometimes been very dramatic about that and sometimes been very uh, controversial, but certainly he has challenged our consciences, all of us, members of the church, members of the community, leaders of nations to do better on these important issues of humanitarian care. So um, he's made his mark and of course he's continuing. He's not done yet either. He's made his mark and um, he's challenged the world in, in new and innovative ways, but he's still intriguing. He hasn't submitted his letter yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, and he only has to submit his letter to God. So uh, that will be in God's hands as well. You haven't agreed with everything <coughs> that he has said. Is that unusual or is that typical? I don't think it's unusual. Again, you can disagree with some individual things that a person says or does and still have a great deal of um, respect and affection for them. And I do have a great deal of, of respect and affection for Pope Francis. I think he's been a good Pope and I think he's really responded to the needs of our, of our time. But he has done some, some controversial things and said some things that have been somewhat divisive and controversial. I guess every Pope does that in some ways. And, but this is the uh, Pope of our day, and um, I think he's done well, but that doesn't mean to necessarily understand or, or agree everything he's done, but um, I think that's true in every age. Is there a place for everyone in the church? Yes. Everyone. Yeah. Um, everyone's welcome into the church, but on Jesus' terms and on the church's terms, not on their own individual terms. Um, someone can't come into the church and say, I want to be Catholic, but I still want to continue to do A, B, C, D, and E that, that the church doesn't approve of. If you're going to be Catholic, you have to accept the faith of the church and the teachings of the church. You can't join a club and, and disobey all the rules. So if you're joining the church, you have to accept the teachings and the faith and the morality of the church. But you're certainly welcome, and everybody's welcome. Jesus established the church. Catholic means universal, but it means that they're uh, also some expectations for someone who, who joins the church. As I said at the uh, right of election we had in this cathedral at the beginning of Lent for those who are becoming Catholic at Easter time, if you're going to be a, a Catholic, for heaven's sake, be a good one. Uh, come into the church, participate in the church, support the church, keep the teachings of the church so you can help build up the church and share your faith with the church. So yes, there is room for everybody in the church, but based on the terms of Jesus Christ, and the church and not on their own terms. You see what's going on in Germany with the, with the bishops. They voted in favor of blessing same-sex unions. Um, I think 176 out of 202 uh, voted in favor of that. Uh, you've been outspoken about uh, pride parades, that kind of thing. What do you think when you hear that? Well, I think I and, and many, many bishops, um, many people across the globe, and many um, officials of the Vatican, including Pope Francis, are somewhat concerned about what's going on in Germany. They are uh, setting off in directions that are not consistent with the history and the faith and the teachings of the church. Uh, they want to bless same-sex unions. They're talking about the ordination of women. Um, they are pushing the, the transgender ideology that the Pope has once again recently condemned. Um, the church in Germany is moving towards a schism. Now, how far that will go, I don't know. Uh, will the Pope intervene, the Vatican intervene at some point? 
I don't know, but it is a matter of concern of what's happening to the church in Germany. And there are still many faithful Catholics in Germany too who are also concerned about that. Will we ever see a <coughs> female priest no. or married priest? Well, we certainly won't see female priests. I think the teachings of Christ uh, as interpreted by the church have been very clear on that. Uh, will there be married priests? There are married priests right. now, certainly in the Eastern Church and uh, the Byzantine Church and the Orthodox Church and the Pope again recently talked about that. He said, this is, you know, a, a fact of history that right now in the Western Church, our Roman Latin Church, we don't have married priests. In the history there have been, in the future could it be? Sure, it could be. Um, it would help you in numbers. Uh, maybe, uh, but I would point out that a lot of the Protestant denominations are lacking for ministers right. too. So it's not just a Catholic phenomenon. Um, but uh, could the discipline change about celibacy? It could, but it's, it's wrong to think it would solve all of our problems because the, again, our Protestant brothers and sisters have lots of issues too, and they have married clergy and women clergy hasn't solved all their problems. And it's, it's a mistake to think it would solve all of our problems too. All right, we're winding <laughs> down. Do you ever look in the mirror one day and think, maybe I should have done something different? No, when I look at the mirror these days, I say, how did I get to be so old? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. So no, I don't, I've never questioned whether I should do something different. Um, I, I know I look in the mirror and um, I realize that in my 75 years of life and my almost 50 years as a priest and my 30 years as a bishop and my 18 years in, in Providence, um, I certainly haven't been perfect. I've never claimed to be a, uh, a saint or to be a perfect moral example. Um, I know better than that. I've made mistakes, committed sins, done things wrong, made errors in judgment over my life, I'm sure. Um, but that's part of being human. The, the beauty of it is that the Lord continues to use us even though we are sinful, imperfect creatures. St. Paul says we are earthen vessels as ministers. We are earthen vessels who contain the glory of God. Jesus continues to use imperfect, sinful creatures like me to carry out his work. That was true when he chose the first apostles, and it's true, true whenever he um, chooses someone to be a priest and a bishop too. Never claimed to be perfect, never proclaimed that I was a saint, um, but you do your best despite your weaknesses and, and your sins and your imperfections, recognizing that in the end, we do our best, and it's all in, in God's hands, but we do our best. And that's my only claim is I've worked hard, I've done my best, and everything else is in God's hands. 50 years this summer as a priest, is that your legacy? Working hard, trying your best? Yep, <laughs> I can't claim to do anything else. I mean, any, any success I've had in 50 years as a priest or 30 years as a bishop, it's been because of God's grace and the help and the support and the assistance of people around me. We have wonderful diocesan employees here and elsewhere. We have great priests and religious and deacons. Any success I've had, it's been because of their help and their support and their assistance and ultimately with God's grace. We can't gonna, do anything without God's grace. What are you gonna miss the most? I'm sorry? What are you gonna miss the most? I don't know until I get there. Um, uh, again, I will still be present here. I'm going to be living still in, in Rhode Island, be living in the diocese, and I will be uh, helping Bishop Henning as much as I can, as much as he wants me to, certainly with confirmations, ceremonies, devotions, teaching, that kind of a thing. So I will be available and will still be around the diocese, but I won't be leading the diocese anymore. And um, it's, it's, time to, it's time to pass the torch. You're not going to put that Pittsburgh Steelers banner back up, are you? I have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's one thing that hasn't changed. They'll still be loyal to the... Uh, I know. If we couldn't convert you during the Tom Brady years, we're never going to convert yeah, you. Yeah, well, that's another <laughs> thing that will be different. I won't be like Tom Brady. I won't retire and unretire. Yeah. When I retire, it will be for good. Bishop, as always, thank you very much. Best of luck in your retirement. Mike, thank you very much, and God bless you and your, and your good work as well. Thank you.